Hey, thanks, Ash. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Ken Exner, the new CPO here at Elastic. You know, listening to Ash and Matt talk about the community and what the future holds gets me really excited. Partly this is because as I've come up to speed over the last six months here at Elastic, I got to learn about the history of Elastic and its community. I learned that Elastic started way back with the first public release in February of 2010 with one man, Shai Bannon, as a search engine. It, is start, it started as essentially a community of one, and it was, you know, for search. But because Shai shared his code with the world, and because Elasticsearch was both performant in terms of speed and scale, and because Elasticsearch was also extensible, this enabled a community to take Elasticsearch and adapt it to their own unique needs and purposes. So it started out as a tool to help Shai and his wife manage recipes and ingredients, quickly saw used for things like searching websites and building product catalogs and more. Indeed, over time, we saw people continue to expand use cases for Elasticsearch beyond traditional search use cases for things like log analytics. And if you're going to use Elasticsearch to parse through logs, then why not use it to power your SIM or security analytics? And lo and behold, over the last 13 years, as Elasticsearch has been adapted and extended for a near infinite number of use cases, it has become a fundamental building block for developers across the globe. Now, the numbers you see here just begin to tell the story. 3.6 billion downloads, nearly 200,000 pull requests. Now, our community and our customers aren't just downloading Elasticsearch. They're helping it to evolve. It stands to reason that whenever developers are building a new application or a new service where they have massive amounts of data and they need to surface relevant insights in real time, Elasticsearch has become the de facto tool of choice. In a sense, all of us here at Elastic and all of you out there in the audience, we are changing how the world uses data. Now look, if you're new to Elastic, I'll spend a minute or two providing you an overview of where we are today. Now, Elasticsearch has grown from a real-time distributed search and analytics engine into a comprehensive and flexible data insights platform. It enables our customers and our community to ingest any type of data and to store and to search and to analyze this data and to visualize and to explore this data, to effectively put this data to work in real time. And because, as you, as you saw a moment ago, that over the last decade, we've seen wide adoption of Elasticsearch for logs and the broader observability space, as well as for security use cases, we decided to make it easier for customers by delivering two out-of-the-box solutions, Elastic Observability and Elastic Security. In addition, we provide a suite of tools that enable our customers and our community to build anything from custom website search experiences to full-blown custom applications that are powered by search. You know, these solutions don't just provide convenience, they're also comprehensive. We offer complete end-to-end -end of observability, for example, that supports all the different signal types, logs, metrics, traces, APM data, and more, as well as real-time ML-powered anomaly detection. And we also offer a complete end-to-end -end security solution that provides security analytics for both threat hunting and real-time detections, and it's integrated with cloud security, and it's integrated with endpoint protection. And for developers, for integrating search into your applications, we provide an array of SDKs, web crawlers, connectors, and other integrations, together with the most sophisticated search relevance APIs on the planet. I think you'll be hard pressed to find more comprehensive observability, security, and search solutions. But these solutions are also flexible. Now, while we provide all these capabilities as part of complete solutions, we know that customers are always going to find ways of, of using Elastic in novel ways and will want to extend its capabilities. Well, with Elastic, customers never hit a wall in what is possible. And that's because of the flexibility and the extensibility of the underlying platform. This means you get comprehensive and complete solutions, but still with the ability to drop down to the underlying platform if you want to customize it. Finally, our solutions are different because they're built on a promise of delivering relevant results in real time. You know, from our origins in search, we learned that speed and relevance matter. So we built these solutions on a platform that helps customers get relevant answers from data in real time. Now, let's dive into what's new, starting with Elastic Security, here in the middle of our diagram. 
from SIM to endpoint detection and response to cloud security and more, Elastic Security delivers a comprehensive, unified security solution. You know, one of the biggest challenges that security analysts face these days is how do you get all the right data from all the different systems that you need to protect? You know, security analysts may need to protect on-prem servers as well as cloud infrastructure, uh, Windows servers, Linux servers, Kubernetes clusters, as well as other devices like laptops and desktops. I could go on, but perhaps it's just needless to say, the matrix here is large. But with Elastic, we're building a comprehensive platform that gives you access to data from every system in your purview. And instead of simply giving you better tools to react to security incidents, Elastic is building tools that help you detect and respond to threats in real time. This means that with Elastic Security, not only do you get the ability to hunt over historical data, but you also get hundreds of pre-built detection rules that are running in real time to actively monitor and alert sus on suspicious patterns. And with our orchestration, automation, and response capabilities, you can automatically prevent threats, such as malware and ransomware, as well as re run uh, response actions that you might want to take during an incident, like killing a process, or isolating a host, or collecting additional information from endpoints. We also hear that one of the more frustrating things that security analysts have to deal with is having to separate signal from noise. With an ever-increasing amount of data that they have to parse through and more and more systems emitting logs every day, security professionals are having to deal with an avalanche of false positives. And they're constantly having new suspicious activity that needs to be investigated. So what analysts need is help prioritizing what to look at. And they want better tools for finding what really matters. Users of Elastic Security can take advantage of our recently introduced entity analytics capabilities, which when coupled with our ML-based anomaly detection, allow security analysts to focus their investigations on those users and those systems with risky behavior, or those that seem to deviate from the norm the most. These priorities are bubbled up immediately so that analysts can quickly pivot their focus to handle the most critical threats. Finally, we know that one of the challenges that threat hunters face is the need to iteratively refine searches as they zero in on potential targets. Often the results of one query can feed directly into the next query, and the one after that, and the one after that. And it is precisely for this reason that we're very excited to bring the new Elasticsearch Query Language, or ES ESQL, to market later this spring. ESQL is a modern, piped query language that allows Elasticsearch users to construct complex queries efficiently using a format that you're already familiar with. This simplifies threat hunting and accelerates mean time to detection. Now let's have James show us how this new experience will work. Thanks, Ken. Hi, everyone. My name is James, and I'm really excited to be able to demo and give you a brief glimpse into ESQL today. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm here within Elastic Security, and I'm currently investigating uh, one of the hosts on our network, which seems to be making uh, a lot of uh, DNS requests to a specific uh, registered domain uh, via a PowerShell process. So you can see here, I have my case open. Uh, I've left a comment saying I'm investigating this particular uh, incident. I've attached the alert, which triggered this whole investigation. Uh, I've even started working uh, on a timeline where I can see those uh, multiple DNS requests being made. So you can see there's about 187 uh, DNS requests to that with your face.com domain. So to me, this is screaming uh, DNS exfiltration, basically a technique where uh, an attacker tries to steal data from a network uh, using the DNS protocol. So I'm at a point in my investigation now where I want to check uh, how many bytes of data I have left my network um, going to a certain DNS registered domains. In this case, I'm, I'm mostly interested in that with your face.com domain, but I want to chart out and calculate how many bytes have left over DNS in general. And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and use uh, ASQL. So let's go ahead and pivot to be able to run that query. So to start off, really simple, we're going to pick our index pattern. So see from, this is the index pattern, and you can see autocomplete uh, really helping me out there, saving me a ton of time. And then we'll start with some basic filters. So let's say where the event.category is network. And we'll filter specifically for DNS traffic using the destination port. So let's say
Okay, that's pretty simple so far, but here's where it starts to get really interesting with the SQL, which we haven't been able to do before. Let's start doing some aggregations and some calculations. So let's say, let's calculate the uh, total bytes. And that's going to be equal to the sum of the destination dot bytes. And we'll split it by the uh, DNS dot question dot registered domain registered. Uh, I want to highlight this though. Um, we are creating a field here. So look how much time this is saving. We're creating a new field without having to use something like runtime fields as part of the query. So a huge time saver uh, and extremely powerful with this ESQL language here. So even if, if we run it as is like this, right? Uh, a really, uh, really nice results. We get this chart, which will actually adapt to our changes as we'll see. Uh, with your face is the, the highest in the heat map with the number of uh, outbound bytes already. But uh, let's improve this query. So let's say uh, we'll calculate this amount of bytes in kilobytes rather than just leaving them bytes. So we can do an eval uh, total KB. Let's say it's equal to total bytes divided by 1024. Again, saving a lot of time with an inline field creation rather than runtime field. And we can say, let's uh, sort it. So sort total KB descending. And let's limit the results. So let's say, let's limit to the top five. And let's also show only the fields we're interested in. So let's say I want to project the uh, DNS.question.registered domain. And let's say just the total KB rather than the bytes. And we can see that now, uh, how the chart adapted to our changes. Uh, Withyourface.com is the highest, and we can see it in the chart as well, 289 kilobytes worth of DNS requests, which is quite a bit. Uh, we can change this chart. Let's make it a donut chart. You can see 80.95% of our DNS traffic is with your face. Now, because uh, we have this charting capability here, um, you can actually see we can edit this in Lens if we wanted to, uh, which is really, really nice. I have that loaded up in Lens here. You can see it's exactly the same query, uh, same chart and everything. But because it's Lens, we can actually embed this into our case. So if I go ahead and save and return this, we are now adding this freshly created chart using ESQL uh, to our case. So I'll add that as a comment. And you can see we went through that entire flow using one query language, uh, creating new fields on the fly, having the charts adapt to our uh, changes as well, which is extremely powerful. So obviously we're still scratching the surface here. There's way more to come from SQL, but I was really happy to be able to put this together for you today. Ken, back over to you. Now let's dive into what's new with Elastic Observability. From logs to metrics to tracing, APM, synthetics, and more, Elastic Observability provides unified observability across your entire digital ecosystem. First, let's talk about profiling. Now, profiling tools work at a code execution level, and they help you understand how long your methods and functions take and the amount of resources like memory or CPU that they consume. Now, they're super useful for detecting performance bottlenecks in your application code. But historically, there have always been two problems with profiling. First, you had to specifically instrument all your code method by method, and second, it was typically something that worked in dev test environments or that worked reactively. But with universal profiling from Elastic, you get an always-on application profiler that doesn't require any code modification. Just drop in the agent and it works. It's quite magical, really. Moreover, because it's integrated into the broader Elastic observability solution, it works with our anomaly detection and other tools for correlating problems. In a sense, profiles are really just another signal type. So when you add it to APM, along with logs, metrics, and traces, you now have a complete picture of your application, from code execution to user experience. Now, let's talk about synthetic monitoring. Elastic is proud to announce the upcoming beta availability of synthetic monitoring. Synthetics enables you to simulate user behavior by creating simulated or scripted recordings of user journeys through your application. 
Using a simple point and click interface, you can record a sequence of actions that you want turned into regular monitoring. This enables you to always monitor for the most important interactions. Finally, providing more and more signal types by itself is useful to customers, but what customers really want is not only more data, but better tools for turning that data into actionable alerts. Well, with our AI ops capabilities powered by Elastic Machine Learning, we enable customers to find anomalies in these various signals automatically. This means that you don't have to know all the different ways that your application might fail beforehand, or remember to create custom alerts for every possible failure case. That's because Elastic's powerful machine learning can tell you when something needs further investigation because it deviates from expected behavior. And not only that, we can help you correlate the various signal types to get to causation. With the Elastic promise of speed and relevance, AIOps delivers alerts that point you to the root cause immediately so that you can get to recovery faster. Last but not least, I'd like to share some updates from our Elastic Search solution. What excites me about this box to the right is how universally applicable Search is and how widely used Search is with developers worldwide. You know, chances are you've probably used Elasticsearch sometime in the past day or two, and you probably didn't even realize it. You know, when you search for, for rides on apps like Uber, or you search for food on websites like Yelp, or even if you go searching for love on apps like Tinder, you are using Elasticsearch. Now, Elastic powers all these experiences and more. And what is also remarkable is how many apps out there require search. You know, from product catalogs to business analytics systems to financial transaction systems to knowledge bases and more. Search is everywhere. Now, we've seen that developers and data analysts love using Elastic search tools for three reasons. One is speed, scale, and relevance. And to ensure that Elasticsearch continues to remain the gold standard for search, we continually invest in all three areas. Over the last few years, for example, each of our 7.x and 8.x releases have brought storage and memory optimizations, which enables Elasticsearch to index more data and respond faster to queries. We've also continuously expanded the ways that we can ingest data, including adding a web crawler and adding support for dozens of connectors to connectors for MongoDB and S3, and we'll soon be releasing connectors for Postgres and SQL Server and Azure Blob Storage and more. But what I'm most excited about right now and what I want to talk to you about today is the work that we're doing to further advance our relevance capabilities. In particular, the work that we're doing on machine learning and vector search. Traditional search relies on mentions of keywords or lexical similarity and the frequency of word occurrences. But users these days, they expect more. Users now expect a search engine to understand the meaning and context behind a search. For example, if a user goes to a site and searches for how fast should my internet be, that search application should really match that query to a topic about connection speed requirements. But doing this requires parsing the natural language to identify the search intent. Now, a vector search engine solves for this by capturing the, the meaning and the context behind that data, any unstructured data, including text, text and images, and transforms, transforms that into a numeric representation. Vector search finds similar data using approximate nearest neighbor, or ANN algorithms. Compared to traditional keyword search, vector search yields more relevant results and executes faster. We've been on a journey over the last couple years to democratize machine learning for search developers. Our 8.0 release introduced native vector search, and since then we've been adding additional capabilities like bringing your own ML models. Later this year, we have plans to connect new machine learning approaches to our BM25 ranking model, too. Uh, but I digress. If you're interested in learning more about what's new to come in our search solution, I invite you to attend our search solution spotlight. Now, some of you may be aware that last year, we announced plans for building out a stateless version of Elastic. Today, we'll be updating that plan to go even further with a full-blown serverless offering. Now, let me explain what all that means. First of all, the concept of serverless will be a pretty transformational evolution of our offering, and one that represents the next stop on our journey to the cloud. We, of course, began with self-managed, which was a version of the Elastic Stack that customers could install and manage themselves. And as we moved to the cloud, we created a dedicated cloud offering where we provision and install the software for customers, 
but the ongoing management of that cluster was still a, a shared responsibility between us and the customer. Serverless will be the next deployment option, living alongside self-managed and dedicated cloud. And it will deliver a fully managed experience that abstracts away the underlying infrastructure. You won't have to wait for servers to provision, and you won't have to manage and scale Elasticsearch clusters. The infrastructure will be completely abstracted away. And what you'll get, it will be more of a SaaS-like experience, one that is immediately available with no infrastructure to ever see or manage. Now, the first thing that we need to do on the road to serverless is move to a stateless architecture. And by that, I mean separating out compute and storage. If you look at Elasticsearch historically, we always combined compute and storage into one stateful system, the Elasticsearch cluster. And this cluster not only combined compute and storage, it also combined indexing and search, which could sometimes create contention between indexing and querying. And often, you sometimes needed replicas of the stored state in those clusters for durability. So we frequently see people implementing replicas in addition to primaries. And this is the problem that a stateless architecture is trying to solve for trying to give you cheaper durability and more efficient data access. But this idea of having a separate storage layer for Elasticsearch kind of already exists. When we introduced data tiers in ILM, we enabled customers to move data between hot, warm, cold, and frozen nodes as the data aged and as a way to save money. As part of this architecture, we had snapshots that save state to cloud object stores like S3. And when we introduced searchable snapshots, Customers could query data that had been saved to cloud object stores. Now, with this architecture, we saw that we were already able to start to separate out compute and storage. And we were already able to move state to cloud object stores. And we were even able to start separating querying and indexing as the nodes that were writing to S3, for example, and the ones that were reading from S3 were different. With serverless, we're embracing the separation of compute and storage even more. And we're introducing a new stateless architecture that makes cloud object storage the primary way that we store data, data in Elastic Cloud. We've also been separating out indexing from search so that you could scale those separately. Now, when, when we prototyped this last year, we actually found that we got 75% greater throughput as well as CPU savings on the same hardware because we weren't having to replicate data on those clusters. Additionally, because we're not having to replicate data, we can also rely on the underlying durability of the underlying cloud object store, which allows us to cut, cut the cluster size in half. Moreover, once we move to a stateless architecture, we can separate indexing from search, which allows us to independently scale those functions to gain even further efficiencies. But this is just the start. Beyond moving to a stateless architecture, we're also moving more broadly to a service-oriented architecture as part of this move to serverless. This means that we'll introduce a new services layer and separate out a simplified presentation layer. This is, this is important because it gets us to a more efficient, a more decoupled architecture with separately scalable microservices. And with separate services handling discrete functionality, we'll be better able to automate the management of those various functions. And this is the true benefit of serverless, getting to a more fully managed experience. With the separation of concerns in this new decoupled architecture, we'll be better able to automate the management of Elasticsearch so that customers don't have to. All customers will see is the functionality of our solutions and none of the infrastructure. I'm excited about this serverless feature and I think you will be too. And with that, I wanna thank you for joining this opening session. To learn about any of these topics, please join the breakout sessions and the solution spotlights. Thank you for joining me and have a great conference.